sounds like what we have is is uh, a hierarchy. You were saying like the U.S. led U.N. world order that was trying to preserve the sovereignty of individual countries, which sounds like the opposite idea of, uh, you know, the concentration of power. That'd be like if individual states in the United States got more powerful instead of the executive. But now that is being rammed up against what China is doing. And it seems like, according to you, like the historical trends are leading to a China or Communist Party dominated world. That's how I see it. I see it. I think that the uh, sort of the autocratic model is the is the model that's been preferred throughout history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the sort of democratic model or reserving power to the states or reserving power to nations or, for example, when, when you have laws that go through, new laws that temporarily empower the president, but they have a sunset clause. So there's an automatic reversion to a less concentrated state. Those are very positive. So we do have people trying to preserve the freedoms, even as there's this trend. Um, but I think that what happens is that sometimes those freedoms can pres- be preserved for a, you know de- dozens of years or decades or centuries. But that over time, if you really look at thousands of years of histories, there is an unmistakable trend towards the concentration of power. And why is that? You're saying it's just because people want more power? People want more power and there are mechanisms that they use and that can be used fairly easily uh, by the powerful, uh, such as hierarchies, such as incentives and disincentives, um, to empower power more so that power is is a gravitational force, um, kind of in the way that physics. How do they use hierarchies for this then? Hierarchies institutionalize the power system. So... Uh, if you didn't have hierarchies, people would really be much more equal. We look at hierarchies. I argue that hierarchies are are a form of informational power. I divide power into three sections, economic, uh, political, or military, and um, informational. And hierarchies, if you look at an org chart at work, you know, uh, if they change the hierarchy, they say, okay, we're promoting Jimmy one level up. And they have a PowerPoint slide, and it's a it's a piece of information that you look at, and you say, okay, now I have to go to Jimmy to get my direction, and he has power over me. It's a form of information, but it's a form of power. One thing that I found interesting in your book was you talk about communism as a form uh, that has actually more hierarchy. Uh, when most people think of it, if if you ask the person on the street about communism, they'd be like, oh, well, it's about people being more equal, right? Yeah, all communists are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, can you explain why communism, you say it has more hierarchy? I would argue it has more hierarchy because there's, it's, it, it the, the way that communism comes out in the end is a dictatorship of the proletariat. And they like to deny it. They like to say, oh, Marx really, well, you know, when he said dictatorship of the proletariat, he really meant democracy. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, not really. Up. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> China, you know, Xi Jinping is talking about, you know, how China has the best democracy. And he's essentially trying to gaslight the whole world into thinking like, oh, I guess China does have democracy. But of course, that's stupid. Uh, but in terms of like the levels of hierarchy, right? Like, so you're saying there's more like more levels of hierarchy in China, or is it that the hierarchy has more control over people? Uh, maybe both. I'd, I'd, and that the concentration of power in China is such that, I mean, the, the the idea of communism is that they accept this concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat. So it's easy for them to accept the Xi Jinping when he walks in the room and says, I'm the new dictator, I'm the emperor for life. And we have a our dictatorial authoritarian system is better than democracy because democracy is just chaos. Ray Dalio says, you know, we're a nation of individuals. China has a government. You know, it has a real authoritarian government. It has a system. There's a man who understands the flow of history. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely want to give him my money to invest in China for me. Uh, you don't even have to. Just the just power of history will condense your money to him. Well, I mean, that's kind of true. Like if I have a pension fund or something, that's he's right. probably- That is true. That there's <laughs> yeah. like, there is very little that you as an individual can do about how your money is institutionally invested. It's psycho history. It's psycho? From foundation. Okay. Asimov. <laughs> okay. Look it up. Well, so the interesting thing about 
China and the Chinese Communist Party is, well, after Mao, it seemed like it was a system that wasn't really benefiting any individual. It was just sort of the perpetuation of the party itself. Xi Jinping has kind of changed that by possibly becoming the next Mao. But there is the sense that, like, the Communist Party itself is just sort of this behemoth that keeps lumbering forward. And now decades of planning is coming to fruition and it is beginning to assert its control over the global system. Uh, is that inevitable? Is that something that can be stopped? I think it can be stopped. I think, we, but I think we have to be much more active in our attempts to stop it. Um, and part of the, I think the message of the book is that um, because history is trending in that direction, we need to take it more ser seriously than we are. So yes, they're causing a genocide, so therefore we need to m take it more seriously. Yes, they've, you know, they're jailing people, they've got the, the Falun Gong taking their organs. All of these reasons are we need to take it more seriously. So this book is kind of one more, add one more reason to the basket for why we need to take the CCP seriously. Well, if history tends towards authoritarianism, no matter what, what what really can be done is just to have another stronger power in the world, like, you know, reassert U.S. dominance, or are we just trading one horrible authoritarian power for another? I think the, the, U, the way the U.S. and Britain really tried to organize the U.N. system um, was quite wise in terms of maintaining the sovereignty of different states, maintaining their territorial integrity. They really tried to maintain the independence of, of the system. Um, and it was a stasis that came in in 1942. So they were looking at the distribution of states in 1942. And they were breaking, not only that, but they were breaking up the empires, the British, the French. They were breaking all those empires up and turning them into sovereign states, many, many sovereign states. So it was, a, it was actually a move in the right direction in terms of freedom, in terms of sovereignty. Um, and it was wise. Uh, so I think it's a far preferable system, obviously, than uh, a CCP-dominated world, um, which is not going to do that. I think if you look at what the CCP is doing within their own borders in terms of trying to homogenize the population, uh, get rid of uh, linguistic diversity, religious diversity, any religion, really, um, other than the Marxism, which is a religion as well, um, you know, you, you really see the danger of what they could do on a global level. Well, I mean, we already see that. I mean, you look at satellite countries, like take uh, Cambodia, for instance, right? Uh, Hun Sen, the president of Cambodia, is a, well, he's a dictator, essentially, right? And he has increasingly taken Chinese money, Chinese investment. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese construction, whether it's, you know, casinos and hotels, uh, which has brought with it the Chinese triads. It's brought with it the human trafficking. It's brought with it like all these problems that come with it. But also, Hun Sen is getting a lot of money, right? So, like you see that kind of thing, and not just like, Cambodia is just one example, and there's dozens of examples, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, that are of these countries that are run by essentially dictators that are sort of being brought into this CCP hierarchy on a global scale. Is this something, is this the hierarchical skimming that you're talking about in your book? Yeah. So so one of the functions of, I mean, I absolutely agree with you about Cambodia. And one of the functions of the way in which power works is um, power can be skimmed from the top and moved to the bottom only to be re-aggregated uh, into a yet higher level. So sometimes what you see is you'll see, uh, for example, some some dukes or something or uh, bishops who get more power. A king is taken, the power of a king is taken and distributed lower down to dukes and bishops or peasants or whatnot, right? But then the person who did that skimming and that pumping down pumps it right back up to himself. And so there's this kind of two level, two step process to well, the concentration. What's a historical example of that? Because I don't I don't quite understand. In France, you had you would have you would have this sort of event, or in um in uh England, sometimes you would have these events where the kings would sort of uh bring power down only to bring it back up. Like to Magna Carta was a sort of sending power down. It was sending power down and it was, you know, 
what happened, I think, from the Middle Ages to the more contemporary or modern eras is that you did have a disaggregation of power among kings, among nobles, um, and that power was aggregated in the state building process, right? Um, so in the 17th, 18th centuries, those powers that were, those nobles that were much more independent, they had their own castles, they had their own military forces, all of those were aggregated, right? And we think of that as a good thing. We think of, oh, well, the serfdom was removed, slavery was removed, but also there was a process where you had a, a more homogenous political system um, that was more controlled by a single individual at the top. So the single individual would be the king or queen or like someone in the city of London, for example. Could be the king or queen, could be someone in the city, could be a president, you know? Um, and in a way, this is, sometimes it's good, right? Sometimes it's good to take power away from the from the nobles and to have an elected system um, where, you, where you elect a president. But at the same time, sometimes that president uh, can become Hitler. And he's got, suddenly he's got massive control of the entire country of Germany, and he can invade other countries on a continental level, where before uh, that unified German state existed, Hitler never could have existed. So it's, it's it, you know, there are pluses and minuses to sending your power to a president uh, that controls huge armies, huge countries. 